everybody. Uh, I'm still Al Rain, the co-chair of Boston Harbor Now's uh, Policy and Planning Committee, and I'm the host for this morning's forum. Uh, Boston Harbor Now convenes these meetings to enable members of the public to learn more about both public and private projects that are happening around the waterfront. If this is your first time at one of these forums, welcome. And if you've attended before, as many of you have, welcome back. Uh, a word about Boston Harbor Now. Uh, we're a nonprofit focused on ensuring that the waterfront and harbor islands are increasingly prepared for the coastal impacts of climate change and that they provide welcoming and inclusive open space to people from all over Boston. Uh, we call this Harbor Walk 2.0. Our work spans a wide range of issues from commenting on waterfront development projects to planning for future ferry service to bringing underserved communities out to experience the Harbor Islands. Boston Harbor now believes strongly that the waterfront belongs to all of us and that by bringing together interactive conversations like this one, we can help ensure that projects are both inclusive and resilient. This morning, we're excited to hear about a project that's expanding and diversifying the types of cargo that can come into and out of Boston Harbor. Uh, I'd like to begin with two quick polls uh, to learn more about who's here and what perspective uh, you bring. So let me ask first, uh, what industry you work in? Uh, the choices are the public sector, local, state, or federal. The private sector, real estate development, marine or maritime industry, consultants, et cetera the nonprofit sector, uh, or education, uh, either faculty or student or other. Uh, we have about 13% from the public sector, 63% uh, from the private sector, 25% uh, from nonprofit, and uh, nobody on this call, uh, or at least responding to the poll, uh, is from the education world. Thank you all for responding to that. Okay. Um, a word about the project before I hand it over to our presenters. Uh, located just east of the Seaport District is the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. If you're my age, you know it is the Boston Marine Industrial Park. This is one of the largest contiguous working waterfronts in Boston. And, and really, it's one of the largest contiguous uh, working port areas uh, in public hands anywhere in the East Coast. Uh, the Marine Park is a designated port area, and it's home to a mix of water-dependent industrial uses, uh, like uh, fish, fish processing industry, uh, shipping, boat repair, uh, and general industrial uses like brewing and more recently lab and life sciences. Today, we're joined by four presenters who will be sharing a proposal to bring a new type of shipping and cargo facility to the North Jetty, which is the triangular thing way out at the end. Um, the four uh, are Andrew Hoggins, uh, the chief development officer at Massport, Shayla Mahoney, the owner and CEO of Easton Salt Company and of this venture, the South Boston Marine Multiport, Dan Adams, the founding principal at Landing Studio, and Ed Washburn, the project manager uh, for the South Boston Marine Multiport. Uh, after their presentation, uh, we'll open this up to conversation, uh, Q&A with all those in attendance. And in the interest of the proverbial full disclosure, uh, both Andrew and Shayla sit on the board of Boston Harbor now. And with that, um, I hand it over to you guys. Andrew, I think you're up first. Terrific. Uh, thank you very much, Al. And uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. A lot of familiar faces and great opportunity to share with you a project that Massport's been working to advance for quite a while. Um, so let me provide a little bit of background and, and context for uh, the project and why it's important to the Port Authority and, and then uh, Shale and her team can take it from there. Um, so we lease uh, the 40 acre uh, Massport Marine Terminal from uh, the city of Boston, specifically from uh, historically the uh, Economic Development Industrial Corporation, which now is essentially part of the uh, BPDA. Um, the the site historically, Dan may have some pictures coming up, but was a series of finger piers uh, built by the Army and Navy uh, supporting the, the World Wars. Um, uh, there's some fascinating pictures of uh, aircraft carriers docked out there uh, in the 30s. Um, Massport leased the site initially from the city in the in the 80s and filled the finger piers and created uh, the land the land area that exists today. Uh, we recently negotiated an extension of our ground lease with the city that runs now, sort of resets the lease now out to 99 years. So we've got 
a good running room for our tenants there. Um, from a policy perspective, Massport's objectives for the site are uh, really twofold and have been for a while. One is to uh, to create and, and grow uh, a cluster of businesses supporting the Boston seafood industry. Um, Legal Seafoods, a multi-tenant seafood facility, have been there for almost two decades. Uh, the Legal Seafood site is now owned, uh, the lease is now owned by Stavis Seafoods. And um, Boston Sword and Tuna is also out there. We've got a number of other projects that are in the works. The other uh, exciting priority for us has been to bring the North Jetty berth back to functional use. Uh, that berth is a deep water berth. Um, and it happens to be on the harbor side, the ocean side, I should say, of the Ted Williams Tunnel. So it's not depth constrained uh, like other facilities uh, deeper into the harbor are. Um, it uh, it provides, it's a hardened edge deep water berth, but it needs a tremendous amount of investment to bring it back to a useful condition. Um, we see it as uh, its revitalization as a, as a vital part of making Boston uh, a highly competitive port. We cannot import uh, certain uh, project cargoes, uh, aggregate, uh, salt, uh, as, Shale, uh, as Shale's business does today um, at the facility. And in fact, uh, certain of those things can't be imported into the port at all because there isn't a suitable uh, facility for them. Uh, we can't bring them into Conley Terminal given what goes on there today. And we routinely get requests for things like uh, MBTA cars or large transformers that um, uh, need the type of uh, reinforced berth. Um, and as you'll hear from the team, there's uh, the exciting opportunity to support the offshore wind industry, uh, which this facility has the potential to do as well. So um, so we've partnered uh, following an RFP. We, we began partnering with Shayla's company, uh, working with them to... Uh, design the site and and develop a strategy to, to fund and make the investments that need to be made that, that Dan will describe to you. Uh, but uh, we're really excited to be in front of you talking about it today. So thanks for your interest. And I don't know if I'm handing it off to Shayla or to Dan. Hello, hi, you're handing it to me. Thank you, thank you Andrew, and thank you, Al. Um, and good morning and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Shayla Mahoney, president of South Boston Marine Multiport and the Eastern Salt family of companies. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with you to show you our development plans for the South Boston Marine Multiport in the Ray Flynn Marine Park. First, I would like to thank Boston Harbor Now for providing this forum. forum. Thank you also to our main partners in this project, Massport and BPDA. Massport has worked with us hand in hand to help bring our vision to life. I'd also like to thank Senator Markey, Congressman Lynch, Mayor Wu, Senator Collins, Rep Beal, Council President Ed Flynn, and Council Flaherty for their advice and letters of support on this project to help make this project a reality. It is with the efforts of my great team and the support of so many in this room that this vision for a multiport will come to fruition, creating good paying jobs in the multiport sector, participating in the emergent offshore wind industry, and developing the underutilized land in a responsible way, um, also addressing sea level change. Um, unfortunately, I need to leave for a funeral at um, 9.30 this morning, but I'm sure my, my team will be able to answer any questions, um, you know, if there are any after I leave, and um, Alice will share, share my contact information um, so anyone can reach out um, with any other questions they might have. Um, you know, it's a really exciting product, project. We're really excited to revitalize that area. And um, you know, thank you all again for being here this morning. Um, now I'd like to hand it over to Dan Adams to do, the, do our presentation. Uh, hi, thank you, Shayla. I'm going to try and set up the share screen for one second. Uh, I just want to check out, Alice, can you confirm, does that look relatively good on your looks side perfect. of things? Right, and, and I'm, you, you hear me okay. Perfect. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm Dan Adams. I am an architect and urban designer who's uh, worked with Shayla, Eastern Salt, and SBMMP for a couple decades and really excited about this project. Al, I think you referred to it as like the odd triangle out there on the edge of South Boston. Uh, that's a great uh, way to say it. It is odd. We also consider it sort of the amazing triangle um, out there. Uh, I like that a lot. Yes, um, it's a funny shape. We sort of already introduced the project representatives, but really in the course of this presentation, you're going to hear from myself and Ed Washburn. 
Ed will be uh, chiming in to really speak about the offshore wind energy opportunities in this area. Uh, this is a little bit of a table of contents of what we're going to go through, existing conditions, design layout, uh, um, the trucking access to the site, history of the site, fit within the Ray Flynn Marine Park, the designated port area, and uh, sort of current status and schedule. Uh, and uh, we'll also be talking about the offshore wind energy, as I mentioned, opportunities that this site plugs into. Uh, on the bottom of the screen, I'll say we also have a website for the project. And on the right side, you'll see uh, an email that if there's just questions or further discussion anyone wants to have, please feel free to reach out. Um, you've already met uh, Shayla. She's the uh, company president leading this effort. You'll hear from Ed and myself, and you've heard from uh, Andrew from Massport. And we, of course, have an excellent team of consulting engineers and designers associated with helping move this project to uh, reality. Uh, I think it's probably already become somewhat clear that this is a really dynamic public-private partnership between the BPDA, Massport, and SBMMP. Uh, and again, SBMMP stands for the South Boston Marine Multiport. And we'll get into the concept of multiport in a second. Some people have said that acronym is too long. I think its length makes it comically memorable, but we'll see. Um, uh, I, I think Andrew addressed this, but this is sort of a long time in the making, going back decades of, I think, wise thinking and planning stewardship and safeguarding of critical assets in the region to ultimately lead to a couple RFPs, one hosted by Massport in 2016, the other by BPDA in 2018 with awards and designations made in 2020 and 2021. Um, uh, SBMMP LLC applied for both uh, and was awarded both on this opportunity to expand the portfolio of Boston's Harbor uh, maritime infrastructure portfolio. This is that odd triangle on the east edge of South Boston that Al referred to. Uh, it's amazing to us. We often refer to terminals like this as endangered species. That was a term I first heard in Portland, Oregon, actually, when they were referring to uh, the rarity of terminals over 70 acres plus for transshipment of goods between the United States and Asia. And I laughed when I heard that term because I said 70 acres. I can't even imagine 70 acres on the East Coast uh, where we work. I would refer to anything five to 10 acres plus in dense urban environments as nearly extinct, perhaps. This is probably, and Andrew can correct me, Boston's last opportunity for a major port facility he mentioned adjacent to the Federal Navigation Channel. The Federal Navigation Channel, of course, being now a multi-century long effort to build a navigation channel in a safe and protected harbor that allows for the efficient transshipment of goods by sea which is far less fuel consuming than other modes of transportation um, into the region uh, where we can bring cargoes of 50,000 tons plus for um, service to the region. It's an amazing sight to us as well because it's also got great proximity to major uh, corridors, I-93 and I-90, Route 1, Route 1A, Logan Airport, for how we can then efficiently distribute goods to people. Um, and then as Andrew mentioned, it's also an amazing resource because it's within the Ray Flynn Marine Park. So we're sort of in a constellation or ecology of great other maritime businesses who all sort of work together, uh, share similar interests of infrastructural needs in the region. Uh, as you can see, we're quite near a Conley Container Terminal as well as the cruise ship terminal and the shipyard, all the seafood processing businesses uh, as well. So a great sort of ecosystem of support within that region. And we would be sort of proud and excited to be part of that neighborhood. It's a complicated site. Uh, it's an aggregation of uh, four historically defined parcels. Uh, the parcel furthest east, which in this case is reversed, it's on the left of the page, is what we refer to as parcel M. That is a direct lease with the BPDA. And that site is primarily occupied by a large fabrication facility built by the Navy. Uh, uh, you can see there it has a blue roof. 
beautiful high bay cross space that has, I'd say, great possibilities for um, fabrication and support of uh, maritime operations, sort of the upland support for maritime operations being in storage, fabrication. Um, then you will see parcel eight and seven and six C. Those will be direct leases with Massport. And those are really where we see the opportunities for cargo laydown uh, and transshipment. Um, it's important to note, of course, that Boston continues to grow, continues to expand, and the metro region continues to consume more and more. And sort of at the core foundation, how do we bring infrastructure that supports that growth and supports people uh, in an efficient way so that people are getting goods in a cost efficient and environmentally efficient way. The North Jetty uh, is sort of on the bottom of this site. It's the sort of clean looking concrete rectangle. Uh, I'm going to ask Alice, do you see when I move my arrow around, do you see that? Ah, perfect. Al is nodding yes. That's what, when people refer to the North Jetty, that is a pile supported structure over a riprap slope. That is uh, sort of the dream infrastructure that is immediately adjacent to the Federal Navigation Channel that was built to allow for 40 foot de deep ship. That was the previous depth of the Panama Canal um, to immediately berth in Boston Harbor and therefore discharge their cargoes. So that is the kind of principal infrastructure. And the irony for us often is the most important infrastructure that no one can see is underwater is the ship berth immediately outside of that pier, which is immediately adjacent to the Federal Navigation Channel, essentially a parallel parking spot off of the Navigation Channel that allows us to bring in 750 foot long ships with 50,000 ton cargoes uh, with 40 feet of deep draft water. Um, so if uh, in the context of, let's say, bringing something like a lumber ship in that displaces about 2,000 to 3,000 trucks off of long haul trucking routes from Port Newark. So it dramatically reduces the sort of footprint of getting goods into the region when we can make infrastructure like this alive and viable. Um, that has incredible environmental justice uh, benefits uh, and sustainability benefits to get goods in transshipment by ship. As uh, Andrew identified, we are part of a constellation of both existing uh, maritime associated businesses, be it the shipyard, cruise terminal, seafood processing, and uh, what we see as forthcoming opportunities for more maritime industrial development. Of course, we would love to think that in time, great partnerships, we've already had some preliminary conversations about kind of, kind of with Canestraro, with the shipyard, how something like a pier or jetty like this could in fact help bring goods into the region. We've had conversations about, for example, the transshipment of steel coils into the region that currently come by ship that could support such industries. Um, <clears throat> the current state, so as was mentioned, the jetty itself was built by the US Navy um, at a very high quality and standard uh, in the period of, to support the World War I and World War II. Uh, and subsequent to that time, uh, there has been significant deterioration of certain portions, while other portions have been sort of safeguarded and protected. But the pier to be brought back to active use requires a very significant uh, redevelopment, uh, effectively significant demolition and reconstruction. Um, uh, this photo, seemingly awkward, I think, is symbolic of the fact that to the right there is the North Jetty and to the left is the upland laydown areas. And from my perspective, shows a little bit of the shame of the current situation, which is to say, like, it is a fenced off, relatively inaccessible and unusable piece of infrastructure today. And our goal is to reactivate it to the service and support of the city and the region, again, for sustainable transshipment. Um, in the world of port facilities, it's not enormous. Uh, it's 16 acres, but that is an enormous opportunity for Boston in that it is incredibly rare to have such a facility in Boston Harbor 
uh, adjacent to the Federal Navigation Channel. Uh, <clears throat> very briefly, as I mentioned, there are a few structures on the site that we are also excited to imagine uh, reusing. Much of what we are in the phase of right now is exactly, so port, I should probably say for a minute, multi-port as a concept, I think is very exciting. Boston Harbor is effectively maxed out in its port operations. The container terminal is packed. The cruise ship is terminal is dedicated for cruise ships and packed. The auto port is packed with cars. Um, uh, you know, I can speak to Eastern Salt and Chelsea is full of salt. You know, um, there is not a lot of opportunity to bring in new cargoes into uh, Boston. And so, of course, what that means is new markets develop, but also pre-existing markets take something like how does lumber or aggregates get into Boston is largely dependent on long haul trucking from points far afield, including places like Port Newark. Uh, you just have to part, hang out around Port Newark at 4 a.m. in the morning to see the lines of thousands of trucks lined up to come up the major arterials to Boston to make deliveries to realize there's more efficient and sustainable ways to get goods to this region than just parades of trucks at night. Uh, this So the multi-port opportunity is reflective of the idea that over time, we anticipate many types of cargoes being able to take advantage of this terminal. Andrew often cites how often it is that Massport has to actually reject cargoes because there simply isn't room to receive them. Cargoes as fundamental as how do we get MBTA train cars into the region, what we would refer to as large project cargoes. Um, but certainly things like lumber, steel coil, an odd amount of agricultural goods that actually come and go from Massachusetts. Uh, and as Ed will describe in a minute, in the short, immediate term, the great demand for construction uh, period support of the huge effort to develop offshore wind opportunities. Uh, that in time would transition from construction phase to things like operations and management, where you can imagine they're already projecting something like 65,000 meals per week needing to be shipped out to the workers who maintain these facilities. Where are we going to ship that many meals out to people, for example, or transport of the crews themselves? So we see the multi-port as this really dynamic concept in time and space. So you can imagine that at this terminal, at any given time, we might have multiple types of cargoes, what we refer to as dry bulk, like timber or steel coils. And we might be processing operations, things like survey vessels for offshore wind. And on any given day, you might have more or less than the other. And in any given decade, you might have more or less. But what it gives is a sort of opportunity for Boston to accommodate those types of diverse demands in, in modes other than trucking. So that said, the, the sort of future of the buildings on the site largely depends in time and space on what those types of uses would be. Um, so for example, what kind of dock equipment are we going to need to accommodate, let's say, lumber on the site? might be a series of forklifts that need you know, weather protection and maintenance, something like this building, building one, which was last used for staging of the central artery project, was originally built for Subaru car washing facility, would make for a fantastic maintenance facility for those dock vehicles. Um, in contrast, something like building two, uh, <clears throat> this is an amazing, relatively brand new warehouse facility, something like this we can easily speculate being a fantastic opportunity for uh, things like small scale fabrication and storage associated with many of these businesses. For example, where are all the offshore buoys going to be serviced to support offshore wind? Uh, uh, these are all, again, contingent on as we move in space and time, what kinds of partnerships we build for users of the terminal. And then lastly, something like the Blue Warehouse facility, a much larger building, uh, could actually be more of a cooperative structure um, of all sorts of tenants and uses in, ranging from uh, sort of fabrication and warehousing associated with offshore transshipment. Um, 
the design of the terminal at first seems relatively simple. We want to keep as much open area as possible um, for essentially flexible storage and transshipment of goods. What's highlighted in the darker gray is simply what would be denoted as the primary routes for uh, essentially uh, dock vehicles, like I mentioned, forklifts or loaders to move through the site to move cargoes. <clears throat> A rendering like this would display a couple shiploads worth of lumber um, organized on the site for transshipment into the region. So this is what we would call sort of a dry bulk uh, configuration. Um, in the uh, right corner on parcel 6C, you're actually seeing a pile of aggregate or um, in the case of Shayla's business, salt, uh, another great resource used by the region. So again, the idea of a terminal that could support different types of cargoes. Uh, on a different day, in a different week, in a different year, for a different amount of time, we could also imagine this terminal having great support for the offshore wind energy. Uh, there will be decades worth of major construction, and then there will be centuries worth of ongoing operations and maintenance of this infrastructure in the ocean. Uh, and there's a vast range of support requiring hundreds of acres well beyond the capacity of Salem and New Bedford uh, to service this major enterprise. So that would range from things like the millions of tons of aggregate that are going to be brought in for the foundations of the wind turbines to the major wind turbine components, which are 375 foot long blades. That's longer than football fields. Uh, to the uh, like maintenance operations of survey vessels, which are 250 foot long vessels with 24 hour operations, monitoring underground cables and stability of the turbines at sea. So each of these are just showing not so much like maybe everyone's used to seeing, you know, renderings of what a building will look like when it is built. Uh, that's not really the case with a port facility. These are sort of scenarios at different days and times of the types of cargoes that would be operating here. Um, something like the parcel M building, we're excited. It's a great structure. We're evaluating, again, depending on the uses of the dock, how that building would be configured either taking advantage of the gantry cranes and the high base base inside for sort of last stage fabrication before components go out to sea, or is it more of a storage facility to um, process materials that are supporting various wind energy tenants or not wind energy necessarily or dry bulk tenants. I wanna you know, give you a break from me and ask Ed, just while we're on the concept of offshore wind, do you mind uh, giving a little bit of context of why we're even talking about this, Ed? Sure, yeah, thanks, Dan, and, and great job. Great job so far. You can go to the next slide. Um, so, just, so just quickly about me, um, Shayla brought me on a little bit more than a year ago to help with business development and project management on, on this site. And my background is in uh, port development. So uh, before working with Shayla, I was working with Crowley. So helped put together that Salem project uh, 12 miles to the Northeast of this site. Uh, and before that I was the port director in New Bedford, Mass. So um, doing a lot of the infrastructure that, that is related to the deployments that are happening now South of Martha's Vineyard. Um, and, and, you know, so that's kind of my background. Um, so I'm gonna give a quick overview of of offshore wind as a as a sort of opportunity here in, in New England um, and specifically in, in South Boston. So this is uh, this is the goal. The, the U.S. wants to build 30 gigawatts of, of power over the course of really the next seven years between now and 2030, which is incredibly aggressive. <laughs> um, I mean, that's the that's the equivalent of 15 of the largest uh, power plants in the in in the United States being built offshore, um, and and doing it with very few port facilities that can actually handle this, uh, very few vessels that can actually legally do this work, 
uh, and almost zero American uh, workers that can that can do this work. So we're at, we're at the beginning of uh, of a very brand new and exciting industry that's going to require not just the people and the vessels, but port facilities that can support this deployment. Um, and it's just really important to kind of highlight the scale of of what we're undertaking here in the Northeast. Um, basically, starting a a brand new energy industry from scratch with very little infrastructure um it, 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 to to and know-how um here in the northeast to to do this work you can go to the next slide dan so just as a as a, as a point of uh comparison so we're getting a lot of our experience from european companies that have been doing this now for almost 30 years but you can see as of 2020 when uh you know 2020 2021 when uh that 30 gigawatt goal was was being put together even Europe only had 25 gigawatts over the previous 31 years. So we're trying to do what Europe um, took 31 years to do. Uh, we're trying to do that in, in seven, again, without port facilities, vessels, or people that actually know how to do it. So it is, it is very exciting, but it is a, 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 a massive challenge. Um, and it's, and it's one that is going to require, private sector working with the public sector, like, like as in this case with um, Shayla, you know, SBMMP working with Massport. And, it were, and it's going to require in the U.S., as Dan said, there isn't 600 acres just sitting around um, in, in the Northeast uh, waterfront acres next to deep water where, uh, where these, where you can do everything at once. It's going to require multiple sites. It's going to require Salem working together with South Boston, with New Bedford in order to deploy even just what Massachusetts is focused on. Uh, so it's important to note that these, these facilities are really critical for the energy future of New England, um, especially if that energy future is going to be green and sustainable. You can go to the next slide. Um, so these are the uh, these are the projections for the U.S. offshore wind procurements. You can see in green, Massachusetts is a leader in terms of purchasing power for offshore wind. Um, it, so it, it, that these are sort of what we're seeing um, in terms of the pipeline over the course of the next uh, seven years. And you know, so these are four C offshore is a you know is a. It's like IHS market. They're they're the uh, market intelligence, um, a, a market intelligence uh, company. So is BNEF. Um, so these are what they see how how it's going to actually um, you know wh where the procurements are going to be. And the key to offshore wind is the states, uh, the public utility uh, commissions or Department of Public Utilities of the states are going to purchase this power from offshore wind companies, and then that will be. The, how the projects could get financed and built. Um, it, you can go to the next slide, Dan. So specifically, the Massachusetts process, project process is called 83C4. Um, and one of the things that we're really focused on, there's a new request for the RFP process that just, um, that just went out on the street for offshore wind developers back at the end of last month. Um, and you can see there are some pretty focused economic development criteria for the first time in the Massachusetts bids. Um, and you can see th these are the, the, the things that they're focused on, measurable employment, workforce development, uh, investment in low-income communities, um, investment in port facilities that, um, for all project phases. And keep in mind, there's, a, there's about a two or three year construction process that happens. Um, and this facility is, is very well suited for construction support. And then there's a 25 to 35 year operations and maintenance uh, phase that that this facility is also really well positioned for some offshore wind projects. Um, and, and, and it's really both. So there's two main types of, of offshore wind um, technologies. One is fixed bottom. Um, so that's mostly happening south of Cape Cod. Uh, and this facility is only about 130 miles from, you know, through the Cape Cod Canal from those sites. Um, and I can tell you, down in New Bedford and Fall River area, a lot of those port facilities are completely packed right now with offshore wind components. So having a support facility like this um, somewhat nearby is going to be critical for the next round of the, of the fixed bottom offshore wind development. So that's one thing that we are, in the context of this 
RFP process pursuing with different developers as they get ready for their bids, which again, are gonna show port facility investment, uh, in investment in offshore wind components, investment in low income communities, uh, investment in measurable, measurable employment. So we're trying to position this site in with those developers for the, the next round of bids, which, is, which are due at the end of January. So that's for fixed bottom offshore wind. The biggest opportunity for the South Boston Marine Multiport is really in the Gulf of Maine. So Gulf of Maine is much deeper than the area south of Martha's Vineyard. Um, yeah, so it's almost 600 feet in, in some cases deep. Uh, and that's going to require a different technology called floating offshore wind. There's a lot of different types of floating offshore wind foundations. I don't think there's one globally that has sort of won the day. Um, so every 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 kind is is sort of different. But it, between now and the end of 2024, the U.S. government is going to bid out lease areas in the Gulf of Maine, and the this port is perfectly positioned for operations and maintenance for things like anchor um, and, and chain that are gonna be required for offshore floating. Um, all of that kind of project cargo that is gonna be related to the offshore wind development in the, in the Gulf of Maine, this site is really perfectly positioned. So we're, we're focused in, in the immediate term on construction support, obviously for the areas south of the vineyard, but longer term offshore wind um, in the Gulf of Maine is really going to be our focal point. And that could happen in multiple ways, right? So we're talking to all developers now about what that looks like. We'll get a little bit clearer uh, sense of what that looks like between now and the end of 2024 when those leases come up in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, but it, it's very, it's very, you know, it could be something where, you know, the foundations are fabricated here at this site and then they're towed up to Salem where they'll put the uh, the turbines on and then they'll go out to the um, to the lease site in the Gulf of Maine. So there's a lot of different um, a lot of different use to, use cases that we're looking at and uh, we're pretty excited about what this means for not only offshore wind in Massachusetts but in particular offshore wind and the employment opportunities that are going to be available for city of Boston residents and uh, in the within 128 um, all of those all of those workers and and um, and folks that want to get in on this new, green sustainable opportunity over the course of the next few decades. So that's that's it for me, Dan. Uh, happy to take questions at the end. Thanks, Ed. I mean, so I think what we've introduced are really our project goals, and I'll go into them in a bit more detail, but it's really from a perspective of environmental justice, much of what we focus on is how to improve transportation infrastructure of the region uh, by creating more efficient uh, distribution of goods, therefore lowering the impact of uh, less efficient transportation in communities of the region. Uh, we want to create diverse long-term and high-quality jobs. Um, the terminal itself is predicted to create just under 100 full-time equivalent jobs on the terminal itself. Uh, I'll go into in a minute how many sort of indirect jobs are stimulated and supported um, by such a terminal as well. Uh, and a big part of that is the diversity of types of jobs that are uh, created and the type of training levels that different people need for different um, jobs on the terminal. From a resilience perspective, uh, one of the goals of the site is to, of course, uh, improve resilience towards climate change driven surge events and sea level rise in general. Um, of course, I'd say one of the goals is to reduce the impacts on the environment that are contributing to climate change by simply making more efficient transportation paradigms into the region. Uh, but then in response to our current um, impacts of climate change and sea level rise, we are proposing to raise the site approximately two and a half feet to bring it above the 1% flood or FEMA flood risk um, at the water's edge. Uh, that of course, supports many of the climate resilient South Boston efforts and becomes not just sort of a defense system for our site, but a defense system for all of the inland uh, properties and critical resources of the region. Additionally, we'd be, you know, uh, in addition to raising the site, deploying um, the sort of critical asset management approach of Massport to raising critical site infrastructure, transformers, generators, et cetera. Uh, from a sustainability perspective, we're, of course, trying to sort of reuse, repurpose, and bring back to life past investments made by the federal and state government by rehabbing the North Jetty 
peer. Uh, we want to be part of Massachusetts' ambitions for the net zero initiative to support renewable energy resources and help that paradigm of energy shift in the region. And then, like I said, we want to sort of join the ecosystem of other maritime businesses in the Ray Flynn Marine Park um, to really sustain that industry workforce, uh, which really build a sort of interconnected web of support. A um, little bit of history, I think, just to understand the site. This was um, often referred to as the South Boston Naval Annex, an annex to the uh, Charlestown uh, shipyard. Um, you can see here, as Andrew described, the series of finger piers um, supporting, in this case, a series of tarped uh, military barges and ships. Um, and you can see what is outlined as our site. You can see the Parcel M uh, building there. And you can, in fact, see an aircraft carrier docked at the time at the North Jetty. This was in uh, the 1950s. Uh, the terminal has been used off and on for various um, events, as in this case in 2005, the uh, uh, birthing of the um, Kennedy aircraft carrier. Um, most uh, One of the most recent events with the Lawrence gas line disaster was where the cruise ship was docked to uh, house all the workers that were working in Lawrence to repair the gas lines. It's, I've mentioned that this is decades of, I'd say, um, really forward looking preservation and stewardship on the part of the DEP, uh, Coastal Zone Management, Massport, City of Boston, the federal government, the US Army Corps of Engineers to plan that such an endangered species of a terminal that was built by the federal and state investments would be saved for generations to come. It's part of the South Boston designated port area allocated by CZM and DEP as a major preservation area effort to save these resources from sort of other more immediate development opportunities. And then more recently in something like the Ray Flynn Marine Master Park Plan update, it was once again sort of safeguarded and stewarded, identifying that this region should be sort of saved as a critical maritime industry asset, um, both Parcel M and the Parcel 6C, 7 and 8 uh, that all make up this terminal. And in fact, it was codified by uh, the Master Plan update that this area would be critical to allowing other types of developments in the seaport region to be sort of non or less maritime industrial was the sort of requirement that this site would be fully maritime uh, industrial. So not only is this site critical for being a resource in and of itself, but unlocking many of the other planned developments in the region. So it's a hundred years, I would say, plus in the making. Um, most recently has, I'd say, be a, a strong charge at the city, state, and federal level to secure the funds to rehabilitate this terminal through a public-private partnership. Um, <clears throat> the overall stats of the project were estimated about a $68 million construction project it will restore to sort of full, strong, super capacity, 500 feet of pier with, uh, we're hoping 300 feet of additional lower capacity pier. We are currently planning for a 40 foot dredge depth, but depending on how some of our conversations go with potential users, we may design the pier to allow for uh, deeper access. We are aiming to uh, go through the permitting process We've already developed 25% design, but get through permitting to allow for operations to begin in 2026. Direct job creation, just around 100 full-time jobs. Um, and we're projecting that it could accommodate uh, based on potential users, 24 to 52 large ships and up to 300 small ships if we sort of establish something like a surveying contract with offshore wind of just how frequent ships would be uh, calling on the site. I mentioned before just the stimulation of diverse economy that this type of operation creates. And this was uh, now uh, sometimes out of date, but still very relevant, um, though some of the words, those of us in the maritime industry are you know, older. Um, when they did the Port of Boston Economic Development Plan a good 20 years ago, it 
identified what I thought was a beautiful list of just all the types of businesses stimulated by a single ship landing. And if you can imagine the diverse type of workforce that supports all of these different, you know, be it line handlers or chassis shop repair facilities, line, uh, you know, ship captains and crew members and garbage haulers and sewage pump out services. There's in fact thousands of jobs stimulated by a simple ship coming into the region. And certainly I, uh, you know, Shayla and others can testify to this in terms of just their own operations in Chelsea, how there's this like influx of people who show up on the terminal just to sort of operate these types of facilities. <clears throat> As I mentioned, we are currently pursuing um, federal support through the Port Infrastructure Development Program through MARAD of the federal government. Um, we are expecting to very soon hear back on our most recent grant application. And I just wanted to take a couple minutes to give a little context. SBMMP is a, so I think all of us here would probably be a fairly new sounding company. Um, it has been formed to operate this terminal. But SBMMP is founded on the shoulders of a much longer, older uh, operation, which is the Eastern Salt and sometimes known to folks as Eastern Minerals um, Maritime Operators in Boston Harbor. They are uh, sort of, let's say, the primary um, provider of public safety road salt to the region. Um, uh, as you have met, Shayla is the uh, uh, president and uh, owner of the company. It is a second now going on third generation family owned company it has operated in Boston Harbor for about 65 years. Um, and I think one of the things that I'll identify in my world as an architect and urban designer is just the uniqueness of their operation of having a high degree of familiarity operating in dense, closely knit urban communities. Um, they have specifically operated in Chelsea, Massachusetts, the densest uh, municipality in Massachusetts uh, during this time, meaning that the, uh, unlike a place like Port Newark or um, the Port of Portland, I mean, they are intimately related to the point that residents live directly across the street. And I think what that has um, propagated and evolved over time is a deep sensitivity on the part of the company of how to build strong community relationships and a sustainable community relationship, both to the benefit of the company and to the benefit of the communities within they work. And it's not to say that those types of relationships or those types of efforts and investments would be the same in every community. South Boston in this context is very different than Chelsea, but it's to say that the company has core to its mission, a, a, a desire to build sustainable relationships with dense urban communities. Uh, you know, of course, one way that happens is through the labor force itself, hiring locally um, people from that community. Um, many of the, uh, uh, people who work at the terminal have been there for multiple decades, um, moving from uh, line handler positions all the way to crane operators and terminal manager positions. Um, so a great opportunity of growth. Um, these are some just, uh, I guess the other element I would like to communicate is the deep familiarity that, of course, a company like this gets working for over 65 years in the types of um, infrastructural uh, and construction logistics that go into maintaining such facilities. The sort of scale of the operations, the construction is, is relatively immense and unique. And this is a company that has developed deep roots and experience and know-how about how to sustainably manage these facilities. Ironically, they are also in terms of the offshore, in terms of Boston context, other than the wind turbine testing facility in Charlestown, they are one of the few facilities that has even handled wind energy equipment. Uh, this was, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the wind turbine near the Encore Casino, which is an MWRA uh, power facility, this was uh, transshipped through the Chelsea uh, terminal. Um, but these facilities require effectively constant construction um, above and beyond what I'd call typical maintenance. 
And so the type of know-how that comes from 65 years of experience is critical to sustainably manage these facilities, especially as we look to a future of uh, climate change and other kind of environmental impacts. Uh, this is the recently completed Rock Chapel Marine Terminal in Chelsea, Massachusetts. It's another terminal they operate in Staten Island where you can see the condition of the shoreline at that time um, and you know a fairly uh, significant construction effort to again capitalize on the deep draft berth and uh, create new sustainable high performing infrastructure. These are some of the examples of just the types of landscapes uh, and relationships that have been developed in Chelsea over decades of community participation, be it landscape uh, development, creation of urban agriculture and community garden centers. Uh, the company is highly committed to engaging with community groups. Shayla is an active, I think, board member of the Boys and Girls Club of Boston. Um, we try and find very creative ways both for the sort of sustainability of that relationship, but also capitalizing on the unique and educational opportunities of these terminals to actually invite the public to engage with the facilities uh, in all sorts of ways, sometimes through public access landscapes, but also through a whole palette of events. We have a great partnership in Chelsea with the Apollinaire Theater Company, where they actually perform stage performances on the salt pile. Uh, every year in New York, we've held film and performance art festivals. Uh, again, Boys and Girls Club often sort of tours to understand how these infrastructures work and frankly, just to get on and see the sort of magnificence and of these ships and the working waterfront. Uh, we have seasonal uses on the terminal, things like uh, seasonal basketball in Chelsea, uh, every year hosting the Taste of Chelsea event. Uh, I think as a demonstration of just how resilient and sustainable these maritime facilities can be once they are built, even in the sort of emergency in Chelsea of COVID of uh, food requirements, the terminal was rapidly changed to support a National Guard food distribution hub serving food to 5,000 families in the region. None of that is to say that those would be the like the specific uh, public engagement opportunities we would see in South Boston. But to really emphasize that I think core to the mission of SBMMP LLC and affiliate Eastern Salt is to find creative ways to be deeply uh, related to the neighborhoods that they work in to really foster a sustainable relationship. As was mentioned, Eastern Salt is now going on to a third generation uh, business. They, they plan when we make these types of investments, it is for um, many decades and generations. So there is a, uh, I think, strong recognition of the need for sustainable relationships uh, with immediate in, like neighbors and immediate neighborhoods. I'll close simply by, again, reminding that uh, we will be having, uh, you know, public meetings as we move through the design process. In the bottom left corner is the website for this project where we'll be posting updates as they proceed. And in the bottom right is the email address that you can contact us uh, with any questions or further comments. And I think Alice, the intention now was to just open things up for uh, Q and A. Yep, I'm going to add Al to the spotlight. Um, both Al and Shayla need to leave momentarily, so I'll let Al ask a kickoff question, and then I'll get to the Q&A, but everyone with hands raised or questions in the chat. Thanks, Allison. Uh, thank, uh, thanks to all the presenters. That, that was wonderful. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to begin with a, with a comment that will become a question. Um, uh, some of you know, I, I was executive director of Massport for three years in the early 1990s. And it was in the early years of Massport's ground lease of, of this site. And, and the, uh, the, finger, the finger piers had been filled in not that long before, uh, about 15 years. I actually remember watching that happen um, with Phil from the Southwest Corridor. Um, but the, in the early 90s, when this land was covered by a combination of central artery staging, as, as Dan mentioned, uh, and the Subaru car import, which this was long before we shifted that 
over to Charlestown, and those things were being constantly sort of checkerboarded around the site uh, and and kept out of each other's way. Uh, it was it was difficult to imagine when the moment would occur, would emerge in the maritime market that it would make sense for Massport and and a private partner um, in one way or another uh, to take on the uh, the, the permanent. Um, uh, future use of this site, and in particular, uh, the rehabilitation of the jetty. So I'd actually like to ask Andrew, um, from, from Massport's perspective, uh, you know, over the course of the last, you tell me, uh, des describe how, you know, how it became clear uh, to you and the leadership of, of the port that, that, that the moment was emerging uh, in, in the maritime economy of, of the Northeast, that it would make sense to to turn to, um, you know, figure out how to do a partnership uh, and actually get this site going uh, in a, in a forward looking way. Uh, sure, Al. So, um, so I I've been at Massport quite a while um, and worked on a um, a master plan we did for the property in two thousand three. Um, and I think that um, at that time, we really identified two preferred futures for the site. Uh, well, we, we explored a few. One was the expansion of the seafood industry. One was uh, warehousing. And the third, uh, the third was bulk uh, along the lines of what, what Dan's, uh, Dan's described. And uh, so over that time, we've, we've been advancing and monitoring the opportunities for those those different uses. Always keeping in mind, as I said in the introduction, that the hardened edge uh, deep water jetty was, uh, as, as Dan said, kind of a, a you know, a, a rare, a rare uh, breed of facility, right? There just aren't, it's an endangered, endangered species, I think Dan said. So that um, just the, the proximity to the, the channel uh, supported by all the the efforts and investments in dredging the harbor. We just had to keep an eye on that all the time. So, um, so the seafood industries continues to be really critical to, to Boston as a source of jobs and has its own role. And we've been supporting that, but, but it was clear there wasn't a need for the whole site to be that use. The, the warehousing really has, uh, found other locations, uh, farther afield. Um, and, uh, and over time, just monitoring the opportunity, um, it became clear that, that after uh, we issued an RFP in 2015-16 uh, and began discussions with, with Eastern that there was a moment here uh, with Shayla to um, uh, to seize and, and, and explore making the investments to uh, really convert and modernize this facility to something that that could support the demand that we've consistently seen. Um, as a couple of us have mentioned, um, I mean, we regularly get calls. Um, is there a place in the port where we can offload this or that? Can we, you know, can we do, can you help us? Can we do this at Conley Terminal? And we've had to turn that business away, um, you know, for, for decades, frankly. Um, and uh, so I think all those things uh, came together to really uh, point to this moment in time. Um, and, you know, I think also we've had great support from, uh, from the delegation in, in South Boston, um, securing funds and, and thinking about strategies for the future to, to capture additional funding. Uh, we've had, uh, good support from labor. They're very excited about, uh, the future on this site, uh, to, to create more jobs. So, so I think there are a number of factors that are, have come together, uh, to, to really support what we're trying to do now. Thanks, Andrew. And I want to thank Al for his early moderating and Shayla for joining us. I think you might need to hop off. Um, right. For folks who don't know me, I'm the Chief of Planning and Policy at Boston Harbor now, and I will be your moderator for the remainder of the morning. Um, I see that Vivian has her hand up. Anyone else is also welcome to raise their hand um, or add questions in the chat after. Shayla, do you want to say a final word? Yep. Yeah, no, I was just going to say thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here and for all your support. And um, yeah, I'm really excited about this project and about revitalizing the multi-port. Um, and yeah, just thank you. Thanks, Shayla. Vivian. So as um, Al and 
Andrew and I see Chris and Tom Butler and others know, um, I served on the Boston Conservation Commission for more than 15 years and actually was the uh, immediate past chair. And as Al has already alluded to, the North Jetty, for example, was the testing site for the dredge materials that came out of the Big Dig, which were once they were approved, were that was then used to cover a spectacle island to create the park that we now know there. So we have seen a lot of uses and a lot of proposals regarding what can happen on this site. And most of them, unfortunately, have not materialized as quickly as we liked. I think this is a very exciting project because there seems to be the funding for it and also the partnerships. I think clearly the Federal Inflation Reduction Act, which will provide billions of dollars for renewable energy and for climate action, you know, is going to make many of these types of projects possible. And so when we talk about is there going to be the funding, there is going to be so much funding, frankly, under, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act that I'm not sure this administration or future administrations can move as quickly as many of us would like to see in terms of renewables. Um, I was about 10 days ago in New London and actually saw at an old site, at the, um, the GE site where they have brought in <clears throat> wind turbines actually made in Denmark, but will be assembled in New London. So the fact that there is the potential with a project like this, where we will actually be able to manufacture, you know, um, assemble and to do things like that to support renewables, I think is very exciting. It is frankly the wave of the future. Um, it is what is needed in terms of the state meeting its net zero emissions goal. Um, and I think it's consistent with that. I mean, I, I obviously, as well as many on this call, will undoubtedly have many questions. And we haven't had the time to talk about the truck routes, but you're only at 25 percent design. And you will be required, as you've indicated, to do a number of community meetings. Uh, there is clearly meetings related to the permitting of this project and such. So there will be numerous opportunities for us to comment, to get more detailed information and such. But looking at it from an overall perspective, I think this is what's needed in the port. It is very timely and there's going to be funding and support. It will allow our port, not only in terms, <clears throat> excuse me, for the innovation that has been done in terms of cargo handling and also the cruise facility to really bring in different types of uses. And I for that, I think, is the most exciting. And the fact that there will be funding to do this, I think it's also going to be um, extraordinary. So I applaud and commend Massport and obviously, um, you know, their partners for doing this. And I look forward to participating in future meetings where we'll get more details. But as a start, this is incredibly exciting. So thank you. Thanks, Vivian. I, for, I forgot to mention that piece of history that you reminded me of. That, I mean, we really did not have use of the site for about a decade uh, when it was the staging area for, for soil coming out of the, the Big Dig project. And that kind of put our, our vision on hold for, for a period of time. Thanks, Vivian. The floor is open if other folks either want to raise a, like you can't always see our physical hands, so the um, reactions at the bottom of your screen. If you use the little up arrow, well, if you click on the reactions button, there's a raise hand option. That's how you raise a virtual hand like Vivian did, or you can drop questions in the chat. Uh, from the standpoint of public engagement, um, I'm a member of the Navy League in Boston, and we do have Navy ships, large ones that come in on occasion. And in the last decade, we've had some flat tops uh, which is smaller aircraft carriers come in and the North Jetty was the only place to put them. Is there anything in terms of an opportunity for two or three or so visits for these to come in during the course of a year? It looks like you have so many ships coming in with only one pier. <laughs> that, that's how... our goal, but I would say, yes, of course, we would love to, I mean, in, even in Chelsea, um, when we've had all the various tall ships events through the years, of which I can't remember. I think the last was pre-COVID, but, uh, you know, we've had the Eagle to the site. We had the Bounty to the site. We did a, we did a lot of tall ships, and that was always um, very exciting because it allows us to tap into the school networks of the region, 
uh, give tours. Right. We've had U.S. Car- Coast Guard cutters at the site. Obviously, in Chelsea, we've never, because of some of the limitations of you know the drawbridges, never been able to take something like an aircraft carry. But no, those types of opportunities are something the company quite uh, relishes. And uh, we've also, in Chelsea, I think what's been great about those festivals is that's when we can really kind of like harness the power of the ecosystem you know in chelsea we have things like the cam sausage company you know and they come they they make the fenway franks for example and they come and give thousands of hot dogs away for free and um and we you know so i think we would quite uh relish that opportunity um those are exactly the types of events we'd be excited to support and yeah our goal in terms of the throughput on the terminal the multi-port concept as Andrew, there's all sorts of demand from the region for, you know, we, you know, the citizens of Boston, the metro region want a lot of things and we consume a lot of things. And we would like to find as many ways to get those efficiently and as possible. So our goal is to make it as active of a jetty as possible with as much transshipment as possible. But certainly uh, there is a seasonality to these things. Um, and uh, with you know, foresight and planning, we are, we have never failed at accommodating these types of requests. Um, And it's quite exciting. I mean, Chelsea, for example, we have cool partnerships. Uh, I actually think it's through Boston Harbor now auction events, uh, um, where we would always uh, purchase some of these cruises in the harbor. And we have set those up as, you know, teacher appreciation cruises on the last day of school. And the teachers all go out from our dock for a teacher appreciation cruise. We have done the done high school proms have left our uh dock on cruise ships and the kids all gather on the dock we have tons of parking for them and they go out on a cruise and come back those are the types of creative opportunities that are not hard for us to um fathom in the in the case of south boston the site itself is a little more remote from any specific neighborhood than chelsea in chelsea people literally can walk across the street from their houses to our terminal in um, this location, we're not quite that proximate. So we don't maybe imagine it being the kind of place that people are coming to on an everyday basis for public access, but through events like you're describing, I think would be a fantastic way to engage people with this site. Dan, if I can break in, <clears throat> the critical part to us is the 40 foot depth. Mm-hmm. We can get destroyers, in fact, the Eagles coming We put them behind Constitution. We can get over that area. Mm -hmm. But on the flat tops, there is no way and there's no place to tie it up and have access for school groups and others that we bring in, you know, on board for a period of time. So Mm -hmm. that's where we are in terms of uh, requests to be considered. Captain Hennessy might be able to add more to it. Mm -hmm. He's the president currently of our... uh, Navy League Council in Boston. Hi. First of all, the whole project is fascinating, and it's great to see a, a maritime city that started as a, as a port, uh, not forgetting its roots and trying to expand a little bit and not have more condominiums and restaurants, although those are great, but the waterfront being used uh, for maritime enterprises. Um, <clears throat> what Steve said is true that even destroyers these days, they've gotten so big. They need 33 feet of depth. Um, aircraft carriers, I, I think that, so to speak, ship has sailed in that the, the only ones we have left are nuclear powered and they need even more than 40 feet. So um, there, there are other ships, though, between destroyers and aircraft carriers that would um, love to have a port visit. And um, finding a place to put them is really uh, terrific. And it's exciting to see this project. Fortunately, we really are immediately adjacent to the federal navigation uh, channel, Um, uh, as in it's like for us, it's like having a parallel parking spot off of I-95, you know, (laughs) it's like it's like, you know, right there. I mean, Mm -hmm. in in in, that's why this is not just an endangered species. It's like the last one. I mean, it's it's that kind of proximity and so for us i mean as as significant as that budget is actually our dredging budget to achieve that 40 feet is relatively minimal um because of all the great work and this is you know hats off to massport and 
uh, the governor and everyone for stewarding the dredging projects of the Federal Navigation Channel to keep that dream alive, right? Um, uh, and all the tens and hundreds of millions of dollars and over time billions of dollars that have gone to that set the stage for someone to use it. You know? And here we have 16 acres right there uh, ready to use it. And, um, and the demand is there. The demand is there for all sorts of uh, uses. Uh, so we're we're kind of excited by that opportunity. So when you just keep mentioning forty feet, I just want to say like, yes, we're uh, we're there too. Like forty feet, we got to get at least forty. And depending again on the potential user, um, you know, we have to assess whether we'd be building the terminal to go even deeper, forty-five to fifty, uh, to keep pace with the Panama Canal. We can be even more specific. Uh, as far as dates, always St. Patrick's Day and 4th of July, the Navy is willing to send us something out of Norfolk. Um, we never know what, but we always ask for big ones when we're able to. It makes a big well, difference. It'd be a pretty fun business. opening event uh, in our opening year. It'd be pretty fun to do something like that. Uh, yeah, we've had the Eagle to multiple of our uh, sites. Um, we've been able to make that relationship Uh the Coast Guard. And um, like I said, uh, we were, I think we were one of the last stops of the HMS Bounty. We, uh, uh, the tall ship events, we've, but, but yeah, we've just never been able to accommodate the the truly large Navy vessels. This site would allow for that. Great. Yeah, Passport's been very involved in accommodating those ships in the past. And it's been a, it's been a great uh, way to showcase the port and celebrate the, the Navy. So I think it's a great suggestion. We'll, we'll talk further with uh the Eastern team about, you know, how that can be accommodated periodically in the future. Stephen and Tom, thanks for raising these issues. Um, Thank you. Michael McManus is noted in the Q&A and I brought it into the chat, if you're not reading that, that the U.S. Coast Guard Eagle will be in the Charlestown Navy Yard this weekend and is going to be open for free public tours. So um, get your Naval present day experience. Are there any additional questions? Dan and Ed, I think you guys just did a really comprehensive presentation. Um, Michael asks in the Q&A, will there be resources for NOAA tidal measurement equipment on site? Um, I will need to talk to you more about that. <laughs> I, I, I don't know anything about that. Andrew, maybe you have more familiarity with that. I do not. We are open to all forms of cool stuff. Sounds like a great use for info at sbmmp.com. <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, Alice. Um, mm -hmm. On our terminals, we have all sorts of uh, participation, again, with union groups. We have U.S. Coast Guard radar equipment on a number of our uh, terminals. Um, we're we're pretty flexible we we don't I, I think one of the cool things frankly about being a dry bulk terminal as opposed to all sorts of other terminals we don't have quite as restrictive security uh restrictions as let's say something like a uh liquid bulk terminal like a petroleum terminal or a certainly a natural gas terminal or even we don't have the health concerns that like sometimes go along with like a scrap metal facility um so that gives us you know, I don't didn't get into this, but it's a it's sort of underpins a lot of our flexibility. A lot of what has made our relationships in Chelsea possible is we've had pretty intimate relationships with the Coast Guard and uh, sometimes U.S. Army Corps to establish even things like our security perimeters to be as minimal as possible, which allows for flexibility, and that can be really valuable in terms of both the um, the abilities for let's say even sort of like a NOAA researcher to access the site to collect data or to host public events um, because we don't have the uh, sort of security limitations that come with other sort of more complex cargos. Um, so I, it's not, we sort of didn't get into that, but in the dry bulk concept of lumber and uh, steel coils, as well as um, uh, the offshore wind energy opportunities. 
they don't kind of come with the really robust security perimeters that um, limit other types of maritime, you know, enjoyment and access. We will be taking you up on that. Yeah. No. As you all know, I mean, uh, Alice, Kathy, you know, well, Shayla loves this stuff. So. Yeah. All right, seeing no further questions, I'm gonna turn it over briefly to our president and CEO, Kathy Abbott, and then I will wrap us up. Yeah, I've been I've been sitting on my hands here, um, really excited and uh, wanna compliment uh, Massport and what's the acronym? SMBB something, 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 something. Well, you know what I'm just gonna say on, anecdotally on that is I remember our site safe, one of our site safety managers once said to me, Dan, we gotta set the, speed limit on the site at 13.3 miles per hour because if you put it at 10 miles and you put a foot at 15 miles per hour no one pays any attention <laughs> but if it's a little awkward and weird <laughs> people actually remember it and they and they notice uh so we have 13.3 uh, miles per hour um uh so similarly that extra m got uh, it that's m m b b yeah we have okay. s b m m p we have to also differentiate ourselves from the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal in uh, New York City. SBMMP. Okay, we're all going to have to work on that. But anyway, I've been sitting on my hands to I really wanting to compliment uh, you all on a really phenomenal presentation. Ed, your information was really fascinating. Your background is amazing. Um, and you obviously bring a lot to to Dan and, and Shayla and the rest of the team. Anyway, I just wanted to thank you guys for a really phenomenal presentation and for an incredibly exciting project for the Port of Boston, as you've all indicated. And, and for, for those of you who've been at this forever, um, this, this project, I think, really epitomizes you know, with the 21st century port and where, where we need to go and what we need to be doing. So it's really exciting to see Boston um, in that mix in this way and uh, looks like a really bright, a bright future ahead. So thank you. Thank you. And I'm sure there'll be many bumps in the road, but <laughs> let's start there. <laughs> thank really, you. Yeah. I was going to say, we really appreciate this opportunity to just share the project. We're, we're at the phase of just, I think, trying to build the partnerships and get insights of how the terminal can be used and beneficial to the community so we can design with those thoughts in mind. Yeah, we really appreciate the community connection and the that look, looking at it from that perspective as well as from the maritime economy perspective. It's huge. Thank you. And supporting the new wind industry. Mm -hmm. All great things. So thank you, Alice, for that. Great. Super. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us this morning for this discussion. Um, there's a link in the chat and that you've heard a few different times. You can follow up on this project at www dot s m s b m m p dot com um, thank you to dan and ed and shayla and andrew for all participating in this conversation um, a recording of this forum as well as links to past forums can be found um, on our web on not even our website on youtube um, we've been recording these uh, trevor actually had the question will the recording be posted yes here is the link to the playlist um, you can find all of our past forums from the beginning of the pandemic through the present there. So we will be posting that information. Um, additionally, our next forum is scheduled for Wednesday, October 25th. Uh, we will be traveling over to East Boston to look, learn more about shipyard initiatives there. Um, and then finally, you can always learn about Boston Harbor Now's work and sign up for our email newsletter at bostonharbornow.org. With that, I wish you a happy rest of your Wednesday. Thanks so much.